So how are kids different? Um, they have different nomenclature, which we'll go over. You know, their bones aren't fully formed, and so they give names to different parts of those growing bones. Kids are born, bones are much more plastic. They're much more likely to bend than they are to break, than you and I are just going to crack in half, right? And they're much more likely to heal up quickly. My two-year-old was on a trampoline at a friend's house, and she was just standing there, and my older daughter jumped, and she just collapsed. And she had a little, full, a little torus fracture of her distal or proximal tibia, and she was out of the cast in like two and a half weeks. They heal up amazingly quickly but they tend to bend and they have a lot of different nomenclature, so we'll go over this. So the nomenclature you need to know, so this is the long bone, right? This is the diaphysis, and we'll, when we look at some joints, we'll talk about this. They end up developing with a growth plate, and we'll talk, go over this when we talk about elbows, that's known as the epiphysis. That connection between the epiphysis and the long bone, that area, that space is called the physis, and that very distal area here is that metaphysis. So metaphysis, physis, and then epiphysis. It's important to know that nomenclature because we want to talk about different fractures. We need to know what parts are actually fractured. Is that distal end, that epiphysis area? Is the more proximal end, that metaphysis? Because that will change the, the basic the name of the fracture. So again, we talked about kids, um, they have bowing fractures, they bend. Sometimes you need a compare. That's why we're born with two arms. <laughs> so you can get a comparison view. Uh, make sure you have a phone number. Because if you just got one view and you think, you know, you got one x-ray and the kid's got sore arms, fell, you get an x-ray, looks fine, and the radiologist calls and says, you know what, I think there's a little bit of, ben I need a comparison view. If you can't call that kid back the next day to get an x-ray, if you miss that phone number, so make sure you have a correct phone number. Sometimes the radiologist, sometimes it's a little more obvious, but sometimes you need a comparison view. Like this one. So that one with the x's is the bowed one. I might miss that. That's why you can get a comparison view. So make sure you have an extra, hey, make sure you have a phone number so you can call the kid back. If it's not, if you read it as normal, and again, the radiologist wants a comparison view the next day. Torus fracture is a buckle fracture. That's a buckling or a fracture of just basically one cortex. If you did an MRI, you'd probably see the fracture go all the way through the entire circumference of the, of the, the child's long bone. But on a plain film, a two view plain film, it looks like it's only on one end, right? So we have that little buckling there, little buckling right there. These kids do really, really well. The more subtle it is, they're going to do really well. But the kid's going to have prolonged pain. You want to find this because the kid's going to have continued pain. The parent's going to go somewhere else because you didn't find anything and the kid's having continued pain. So let's, let's find it. Let's find the fracture. Let's look for these things. You really want to examine the end of the cortex. And again, these very, especially these young babies, they don't have a lot going on in these joints. It's all cartilage. It's all radiolucence. So you don't have that much to look at. So look at the cartilage or look at the ossified stuff that's there. That's not normal. This little kind of bowing. That's not normal. That little blip. So make sure you follow the entire cortex edge and that it needs to look smooth. Again, just a little bowing here. Not normal. Kid's got some pain when you push in the area. Little bit of bowing. Can be very subtle. Would this kid do fine if you did nothing? Yeah, probably. But again, the kid's probably going to have a little bit of pain and the mom's going to want to know why this kid has continued pain. This is a little more significant fracture, which we'll just talk about. A little bowing right there. Just a little, a little bit out of place. Toddler fracture. Toddler fracture is very common. This is what's considered not non So child abuse is now non-accidental trauma, right? So this is not non-accidental trauma. This is very common. Kids do it. So they're toddlers, they're learning to walk. They put the foot down and they twist. They put the foot down in the cushions in the couch and they twist. And they get this very subtle kind of twi twisting, spiral. Sometimes it's linear, a lot of times it's spiral. Fracture. Sometimes it's a little more obvious than others. This one's a little more obvious. This one's a little less obvious. You like to see it on two views. Sometimes it's not. But it tends to be at the distal tibia and a young toddler. Parents seem very appropriate. They come in quickly. The kid doesn't want to bear weight. Kid is an otherwise normal exam. Sometimes it's hard to tell in these kids if they're not cooperative, but they just don't want to bear weight on that hip. They don't have a fever. They have good range of motion. They just don't want to bear weight. They don't always have tenderness over the area. So the first place I'll x-ray, rather than going from hip to toe, is that tib fib area, because it's just such a common fracture in these kids in the right age group. Again, it can be very, and that's the beauty of the PAC system or the digital system, is you can blow this up, make it really ginormous, and then you see this kind of subtle lucency there, a little subtle lucency there. 
Again, they tend to be more of a, if you got an MRI, it'd be kind of a spiral looking view. Very normal. So Salter Harris fractures. This is why it's important for us to know the nomenclature of those growing joints where they're all born, it's all cartilage, it's all loosened, and then it starts to ossify. So you have the presence of these long bones that are getting longer. They develop these growth centers, these growth plates, and therefore we need to know the nomenclature. The progno if you have a fracture in this area, the prognosis is going to be based on whether it's a mild fracture, we'll show some pictures, or more serious fracture. So a Salter 1 is going typically only through the growth plate. It doesn't disrupt the blood supply, so the kids do really, really well. A Salter 4 or 5 involves both the epiphysis, the metaphysis. We'll show you some pictures of that. There's a lot worse prognosis, and they can actually, because this is where the bone gets its length, at the epiphysis, at that growth center. And if there's a disruption in the growth because now they've injured their blood supply, they can actually have a limb length discrepancy. Not so bad if it's your arms, kind of a problem if it's your legs. And sometimes they don't, if it's a Salter 5, we'll show some ankles, they sometimes don't get diagnosed until they'll suddenly this foot, is, this leg is not growing correctly. So again, not so bad if it's your arm, but it's pretty more significant if it's your, if it's your leg. So this is Salter 1. Again, the fracture is through the growth plate. It's going to look the same. It may look completely normal. You want to get two views because look at this epiphysis. It just looks like it's kind of moved over a little bit. That's slipped. That's still a Salter 1. It's pretty significant. It needs to be reduced, but it's just slid or slipped or it can look the same or normal. So if you get an x-ray and the kid's tender over that distal limb right over the growth plate, that's typically what we'll call like a Salter 1. It can look totally normal on the x-ray, but it also can have this slipped area of the epiphysis just slid over. So make sure you have two views. This is a Salter 2. So this is proximal to the growth plate. This is the metaphysis. So the fracture is through the metaphysis. This kid also has a mid-shaft fracture right here. Oops, hold on. Mid-shaft fracture. But that is a Salter 2 through the metaphysis. Salter 3 is through the epiphysis. It goes through the growth center and out the epiphysis. Through the epiphysis, through the epiphysis, but not involving the metaphysis. Salter 4 does both the metaphysis through the growth center and then out the epiphysis. Depending on the percentage of the area that's involved, it's going to have more or less bad outcome. If it's just this little bit right here, kind of on the edge, that's going to be less likely to have a bad outcome compared to one that goes straight down the middle. So the percentage of the area, the growth area that's involved, is going to impact how this ends up as an outcome. And then Salter 5 is actually a crushed, right? There's rammed. That growth plate is smushed. And it can look absolutely normal. And you're looking at this going, wait a minute. This kid jumped from, as he's like, you know, jumped off the first story he's into, a jumping into a pool from the roof. They're all jumping off the patio on the second story. He lands on the cement. He can't ambulate. His angle is really, really swollen. You're looking at extra, going, damn, I thought I was going to see a fracture. Well, you are. It's just a smooshing of the growth plate. So think about it when the mechanism, a significant mechanism, can't walk on it, a lot of bruising, a lot of swelling, and yet there's not much on the x-ray. Get a comparison view, because you'll see that growth plate is nice and wide on the comparison view, on the uninjured ankle, assuming you didn't land on both ankles. So again, it's the mechanism and the exam. You've got a significantly swollen ankle, a lot of bruising, bad mechanism, and yet I don't see much of an, of an injury. That's a smushed, a narrowed growth plate. And the, we want to pick these up, because that, especially in an ankle, because of that growth arrest problem. That needs to be referred to it. Any non-weight bearing, and that kid needs to be referred to an orthopedist. So the nomenclature, I remember, is Salter, S-A-L-T-R. S is same or slipped. We talked about that epiphysis on that, that lateral views. Make sure you have two views that looked a little slipped. It's not just one view. You've got to see it two views. A is above, so it's above the epiphysis. It's in the metaphyseal area. Salter 3 is it's in the epiphysis, through the growth plate and out. Salter 4, through and through the metaphysis and epiphysis. And again, the percentage that's involved will determine the, the outcome, whether it's good or bad. And then Salter 5 is it's just crushed. It's just rammed. Think about it in the mechanism, a bad, bad injury, kid held from a, a, a height and onto that ankle. He's really swollen, can't ambulate, and yet you don't see much on the x-ray. Think about a Salter 5 where it's just crushed.
Some red flags in young kids. There is child abuse out there, non-accidental trauma. There are some things that should be like, ding, 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 I see this on the x-ray. Not normal. So the first thing to think about is a long bone fracture in a very young child. It takes a lot of energy to break your femur. It takes a lot of energy to break your humerus. Two-year-olds are not doing enough to do that, although I've seen some male boys tend to get into trouble. I've seen some of my nephews climb to the top of trees. Theoretically, they could fall out. It's, the mechanism sounds right, but in general, kids less than three years of age, they're not doing a whole lot to break a long bone like that. It takes a lot of energy. I had a young kid come in. She was, I think the baby was about a year and a half with a femur fracture. Dad had fallen down the stairs with the child. Dad had a femur fracture too. Okay, I believed the story, right? But in general, kids less than three years of age, they're not doing enough to mount the energy to break a long bone. So if you see a mid-shaft long bone fracture in a kid less than three years of age, you know, and they weren't brought in by EMS in a motor vehicle accident, think about non-accidental trauma. The second is what are known as metaphyseal fractures. These are fractures in the metaphyseal area of the bone, remember? That's in the long bone. This is the epiphys. That's where the growth center is going to happen. That's where the length of the bone is going to happen. Before the kid starts to ossify anything, there's just a lot of cartilage here. These are fractures on the metaphyseal end. They get these little kind of chip fractures. These little kind of subtleness is just off the edge. They can be very tiny. So take a good look, especially a kid that comes in, they're limping, they're not wanting to move the limb, they're not wanting to move their weight on that leg. What is the mechanism that gets this type of injury? It's a twisting. There's only one way to get this, and that's for someone to pick that limb up and twist it, and it pulls off a chunk of bone. You can have corner metaphyseal fractures. You can have these bucket handle me me or, um, metaphyseal fractures. They're all the same mechanism. They look a little different, but they're all the, basically someone twisted that limb. This is not an injury from a kid falling off their tricycle. This is not an injury from a kid falling out of a bed. This is a twisting injury. They have very, very strong periodic, and it basically pulls a chunk away. So this should send up a red flag. Long bone injury in a kid less than three, they just don't have enough energy to do anything like that. Or metaphyseal fracture, this kind of little chip fracture, a little something off the edge. It takes energy, it takes a twisting to make that happen. So that should send up a red flag. If you see periosteal newborn, that's an older injury. The kid's now coming in for a new complaint and now has periosteal new bone in another area. That's multiple injuries. That's, again, something to think about. Non-accidental trauma. I'm going to highlight that a little bit. It's just a little bit kind of a raised area along the edge of the bone. That's an injury that happened a little while ago. Not today. All right, let's talk about elbows. Oh, I want to go into elbows because they're hard to read. There's a lot of things to look for, it, and there's a lot, it's very common. Kids do a lot of falling. They do a lot of outstretched stuff. And the energy tends to go through their elbow. You and I, we break our wrist. The money tends to come out their elbows. That's where their injuries tend to be. So the first thing is, how do I know I have a, a adequate film? The first thing to look for is what's known as the figure of eight. You want to get a good hourglass or figure of eight sign to know that you have, you want to see it in order to know that you've got a good lateral. Because there's some subtle things we're going to look for farther down we talk about that you really can only see if you have a good lateral. Give the kid a pain medicine. I see my resident say, oh, he's not in pain. The poor little kid, he's two, he fell. He's not moving his arm. It's swollen. Don't you think he's in pain? Give him a good dose of Tylenol. Give him a good dose of Motrin before, give him both, before he goes to x-ray, because it's going to hurt. So what you're looking for is this, what they call it the figure eight or the hourglass sign. Look for that, and you'll know you have a good lateral, OK? Not so good figure of eight, same elbow. Not so good figure of eight. I'm like, what? It just kind of looks messy here. What's going on? Good figure of eight. And I'm actually seeing some other things. This is the hourglass sign. I'm seeing a little break in the cortex. There might be a fat pad, a little break here. I might not have seen those things if I didn't have an adequate good lateral. So make sure first that you have that good figure of eight sign or that hourglass sign.
There's something called the wrinkled hourglass. You say this to a radiologist, they're going to be really impressed. I think he's got a, I don't see much, but I'm seeing a wrinkled hourglass sign. Would you agree? You'll be very impressed. This is a wrinkled hourglass. It's a sign of an injury, likely a supracondylar fracture. There's something going on in that distal arm. There's something going on in that elbow. It should be smooth, remember? Much smoother appearance, that in and out, figure of eight or hourglass sign. It looks a little wrinkled. That's may sometimes the only sign you get. We'll talk about fat pad signs. This kid has probably a fat pad sign too. But you will impress the radiologist if you say he's got a wrinkled hourglass sign. Okay, so remember kids are born with like nothing in their elbow, right? It's totally radiolucent. It's because it's all cartilage, right? And eventually it has to ossify. We'd never get out of the birth canal if we were all ossified when we were born. We have to be flexible and bendy to get out the birth canal. But at some point, we got to ossify, right? We got to become a, like a normal human being. And so their elbows ossify in a certain pattern. They develop what are known as six ossification centers. They come in a certain order. This does not change. When they first appear can change. So the order doesn't change, but like girls will get them a lot quicker than boys. Boys are the weaker sex. I can say that. They tend to be a little more delayed. So you have an eight-year-old girl that will have a lot more ossification centers than a boy. So the appearance, the order will never change. When they fully ossify and latch onto their long bone, that can change. So you can have one ossification center that's just in a big hurry to get big and bind. And the other ones are just kind of trailing behind. But the first blush of appearance, we'll go over some films, doesn't change. So that order of appearance never changes. Generally, they get one every couple of years. So one-year-old, three-year-old, five, every couple of years you'll see a new one. Again, highly variable. Girls tend to be a lot earlier than boys tend to lag behind. Eight-year-old girl will have a lot more ossification centers typically than an eight-year-old boy. And again, when they get big and fused to their final butt long bone, that can vary. But that blush of appearance, that order of appearance doesn't change. So the order, you probably remember creto, capitellum, radial head, internal condyle, trochlea, lecranon, external condyle. I personally like come ride my train of love. Capitellum, radial head, medial condyle, trochlea, olecranon, lateral condyle. Whatever you like to remember, that's the order that you should see them come in. And we'll show how this can be important. First is, they, so we see here, this young baby, six months old, got a little blush of a capitellum going on. Okay, not much else going on. There's no radial head, right? No medial condyle, nothing down here, nothing up there. Here's a four-year-old, little bit of blush of a radial, little bit of blush of a medial condyle. Come ride mine. Here's an eight-year-old. This is probably a boy, because he hasn't developed much more than that four-year-old child that we saw before. It's gotten bigger, capitellum, radial head, medial condyle. But not if you had done a ladder, you wouldn't see much more. It's a boy, maybe a little bit behind, that's okay. And then here's a 15-year-old, fully ossified, large, fully fused to their long bone. Here's one with all of them, capitellum, radial head, medial condyle, trochlea, just a blush, olecranon, appeared after, but is clearly in a big hurry to ossify, because it's a lot bigger than that trochlea. And then the lateral condyle. Come ride my train of love. Okay? We'll talk about that in, in an injury in a second. So we made sure we had a lateral. We know the ossification centers and the order of appearance. So the next thing to look at was one of this fat pad sign. Robert talked about this a little bit. In an injury where you're kind of in that joint space, you're pushing stuff out, it's now visible. You now have blood and fat that's visible. What's normal in a normal x-ray in a young child is an anterior fat pad. That's normal. You see a little bit of blush, a little bit of lucency hugging that anterior on the lateral, hugging that anterior femoral line. That's normal. What you shouldn't see is a posterior fat pad. So this is normal. A little bit of hugging of lucency. It's hard to tell because there's a lot of lights here. But there's a little bit of lucency there, a little bit of lucency here. That's normal. Anterior fat pad, normal. Subtle, normal. What's abnormal is what's known as a sale sign, so a big kind of pooching out. And that's that layering of blood, fat with blood. Fat, blood, fat, blood. That horizontal line that Robert talked about. If it's a sale sign, if it's pooched out a lot, that's not normal anteriorly. That's known as a sale sign. Posterior fat pads, always abnormal. You should never, ever, 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 ever see fat pooching out, lucency pooching out the backside. Never, ever, ever. Subtle, now it's too big, not okay. Remember, it's supposed to be subtle on the anterior, so that's a sale sign, posterior never. Those are indications this kid's got something going on in the elbow. 
And even if I don't see any other boniest, and then we'll go over some lines that we should look, everything else looks normal, I'm still going to splint the kid because he's got something going on here, and that kid needs to have follow-up. There's your wrinkled hourglass, too. And we talked about that wrinkled hourglass. Fat pad, fat pad. Anterior fat pad, sales sign, posterior fat pad, never normal. So we looked for the lateral, we know our ossification centers, we now look for fat pads. Fourth thing we're looking for is something called the anterior humeral line. We're going to run an anterior humeral line down on the lateral. It should run, if you run down the anterior surface of the humerus, it should bisect the capitellum, right in the middle third. What you should not see is it bisecting just the front. That's a capitellum that's pushed backwards. That's a supercondylar fracture, till proven otherwise. You see fat pads in this child. See a little bit of kind of a cortical break. There's the fat pad. A little bit of a cortical break. But if you follow that anterior humeral line, it's only barely bisecting that capitellum. That capitellum is pushed backwards. That's a supercondylar fracture. On the AP view, you actually can see a break in that distal humerus. Supercondylar fracture. There's all sorts of supercondylar fractures. Again, the subtle ones, the type ones, can be the ones that just have a fat pad. We're going to assume that till proven otherwise. Or it can have where the anterior humeral line, you run it down, and that capitellum is just kind of pushed back too much. Type 2, type 3, they're not even in the same room. Obviously, these types need to go to the OR. Again, we're not really talking about management. More to just show you kind of pictures. The next line you're going to look for is something called the radial capitellar line. This is running a line through the radius. It needs to bisect the capitellum. No matter which way you take the film, it should always run. Radius into the cap, ra the, you know, hat, the cap on top of the head. The capitellum on top of the radial head, cap on head. So it needs to run. On any view, the radius, you run it up, needs to bisect the capitellum. If it doesn't, this is a nursemaid elbow or a supermarket elbow. Why do we not see this on x-ray? Remember, this is the dislocation of that little radial head, mom, or somebody pulls on the child's arm, kid doesn't move it, no history of fall. You send him to x-ray, what does the tech do? He supinates the arm, he relocates it, it looks normal on the x-ray, that's why we don't ever see it on x-ray, or we reduce it ourselves, we don't even send him to x-ray. So this just shows we're missing, we're running that radial capitellar line, we're missing capitellum. Running that radial line, we're missing the capitellum. Now the child's reduced, running that same line, radial capitellar line. So look for that line. I've seen this missed by good ear docs. So we did that anterior humeral line. We did the radial capitellar line. Radial head dislocation. Again, you look at this, you're like, oh, OK, a little bit of fat pad. Maybe it's too big than normal. So I'm going to call that an anterior. Don't really see much of a posterior fat pad. I've got a good figure of eight there. I'm following my anterior humeral line down, bisecting the capitellum. That looks pretty good. If you didn't know about this radial capitellar line, you would not realize you have a radial head dislocation. And that needs to be reduced before that patient goes home. Again, radial head dislocation. It's missing it. It needs to be on every view, right? This one looks not terrible, but it needs to be on every view. Montasia fracture, again, kids tend to, money tends to be here, but if you see a mid-shaft ulna fracture, and it could be a Boeing fracture, it can be a subtle green stick, which is just one side broken, but if you did an MRI, it'd actually be through and through, which is on a plain film that looks like it's on one edge like this, like that. Make sure you look at the elbow. Make sure you're not also dealing with a radial capitellar line dislocation, a radial head dislocation. So your money, don't just concentrate here. Anytime you see a mid-shaft ulna fracture, whether it's a green a child, whether it's just through one side like a green stick or a bowing fracture we talked about, it's bent, make sure you look at that elbow, make sure you've seen that radial capitellar line. Montasia fracture, again, it can be a proximal, this is a proximal ulna fracture. So it can be a mid-shaft or proximal ulna fracture along with a radial head dislocation. So if you see a mid-shaft or proximal ulna fracture, make sure you look at that radial capitellar line. And Galeazzi kids just, again, the kids tend, the money tends to be in the elbow, the energy just tends to go out the elbow, and the wrist tends to stay okay. But this, is, again, is the opposite. We're not going to do too much on it. Distal radius fracture and the ulnar dislocation. Again, the money we're talking about right now is the elbows. This, so this, I got a kid, he's, he, he fell, you know, he, he's painful elbow, swollen. I don't see much. I've got a good AP. I don't see very much. I've got a good lateral, right? I've got, whoop, let me go back. I've got a good figure of eight. I don't really see 
uh, fat pad signs. But he seems to be very, very tender. I get an oblique, and he seems to be tender, kind of that lateral edge. I get an oblique. I'm looking, think kid, who had a good AP and a lateral. I see the capitellum, I see the radial head, I see the medial condyle. I'm seeing something over here on the lateral condyle. But I don't have my trochlea. I don't have my, if I did a lateral, I wouldn't have my olecranon ossification center. They're out of order. This can't be the lateral condyle ossification center. It has to be a fracture. So that's why this is important, because the ossification centers come in a certain order. If you're seeing one that's out of order in the setting of trauma, it's probably a fracture and not an ossification center. Does that make sense? The other thing you can have is a radial head fracture. So kid, same kid, fall, you don't see very much, maybe there's some fat pad signs, but you check, you still checked all the cortexes, your anterior humeral line looks good, radial capitellar looks fine. He's still got some pain. Think about a radial head injury, and that's the beauty of the PAC system. The, the radial head should be this nice, smooth contour. My smooth contour. If it starts looking like the end of a baseball bat, that's not normal. End of a baseball bat, not normal. It should be smoother than that. If it makes a right angle, bones don't make right angles. If you see something like that on a two-view plane film, that's not normal. Bones don't make right angles. That's a fracture until proven otherwise. Again, it's a three-dimensional object. You have it as a two-dimensional film. It's going to look like a right angle. That's not normal. And this kid also has a proximal ulna fracture. Again, the beauty of the PAC system, you know, you can blow this up and go, oh, yeah, there's a little bit of a crack here. Is that kid going to do fine if you missed it? Yes. But it's nice to be able to tell the parents this kid's probably going to have pain for a little while. It's more than just a bruise, right? The kid's going to do fine. Again, very stiff. if you blew this up, you'd see a little bit of a crack right there. That's the beauty of having the digital systems. Now we can blow them up ginormously. I love it. A little bit on hips. There's a lot we could talk about. I just want to show you some film. So this is skiffy. This tends to be older kids. They tend to come in when there's already money in the hip and you see some subtle changes that, we'll see changes that we'll show you. But they can come in when you just have widening or regularity of that growth plate. That's where the comparison views can really come into play. What you don't want to miss is when it's already starting to slip. There's something called Klein's line or Tretho. I don't know why Dr. Klein must have done first because we tend to call it after him. And you want to follow the lateral edge of the femoral neck. It needs to bisect the epiphysis. So again, we want to, I've blown both of these up. You want to see it, by, since it's missing it, it's, missing that edge. That one looks like it's just getting it, but that one's totally missing it. You want to get both films. It can be bilateral. I mean, get both hips, because it can be bilateral. They'll come in complaining of one hip, but you want to make sure that it's not also starting up in the second hip. So you want to follow that lateral edge of the femoral neck and make sure that it's not, that it, that it bisects that epiphysis. It tends to fall that, that ice cream cone appearance, as they talk about, this is your ice cream, this is your cone. It tends to fall, that cone tends to fall, or the ice cream part tends to fall medially. And so it's going to miss. If you draw that line up that lateral edge of the femoral neck, you're going to bisect it here, but miss it here, because that whole epiphysis, that whole ice cream on top of the cone has slipped medially. So this is why, so this kid, which, which kid do you think the kid probably complained of? His left, right? But you have to get the x-ray of the right, even though he's not complaining of it, because it can be bilateral, and you don't want to miss it. They're going to go in there and pin both hips. It can fall, the cone ice cream part can fall laterally. It tends to be medial, but every once in a while it can fall in. It's still the same thing. It's still skiffy, but for some reason they just fall laterally. Not very common. Most of the time they go medial. Avascular necrosis, again, they tend to come in after the hip has had a lot of changes. This is a blood supply problem. Tends to be skinnier boys, as opposed to skippy. Tends to be a little heavier boys, although not always. And again, they get that just the whole femoral, that whole ossification center, that whole femoral head is just gone. Osgood Schlatter, last thing to talk about. This is in growing kids, kids that do a lot of um, athletes, kids who do a lot of running, soccer players. The apophysis is a growth plate. It does not contribute to the overall length of the bone. It's just, it can be an area where tendons insert, but it doesn't add to the overall length of the bone. There's two ones to know about. The first is Osgood Schlatter. That's the tibial tuberosity, apophysitis. They'll come in with knee pain. They're very tender over that area. Maybe it's a little bit more, a lot of times it's bilateral, sometimes a little more swollen on one side. X-ray doesn't show much. It just shows that they're, let me show this picture. 
just a little, that's the area that's tender. It hasn't fully fused. It hasn't fused to the long bone. And the problem is the treatment is stop doing what you're doing. <laughs> the soccer is what's hurting you. The deep knee bends, the football practice, all of that is really affecting this. And it's really not going to go. And some kids, it will get, you know, they'll wax and wane. My dad, my daughter used to Irish dance. And she was on a national competitive team, went to world championships, and every kid either had Osgood Schlatter or Severs disease. They all were having these recurrent bounce. And so they would pull back on their dancing, and it would get better, and they would dance again, and it would get worse. And it doesn't really go away until that apophysis fully fuses to long bone, about the age of 16 or so. Calcaneal apophysitis is called Severs disease. This is where the Achilles tendon inserts. It can be bilateral. It tends to be in girls a little bit later, or girls a little bit earlier than boys. And it's one of the most common pediatric, one of the most common causes of heel pain and Irish dancers um, in, in kids. And again, it's one of those waxing and waning things, back off in your dancing, back off in your football, let it get better. Again, it won't get fully better until that apophysis fully fuses to the long bone. And it can be bilateral. And I think that's it. Thank you very much.